Let's open our Bibles tonight in the 19th chapter, the 19th chapter of the book of Genesis. I tell you, it's kind of kind of rough to come in town, find the old preacher like he is. We'll pray and we'll ask God to do something. Amen. I really appreciate God keeping him around for till I met him, till I come to know him. I remember <clears throat> coming to this church a good many years back, preaching a revival, and there was a whole lot of people around here then. I was glad that God had brought him here. A lot of them not here anymore. A lot of them sired up, but uh, whatever. I want to say this tonight many times in my life. I don't know about nobody else's, but I've been pastor a long time. been saved 32 years last Saturday. Started preaching the next week after I got saved, so that's been 32 winters ago. I made a lot of mistakes pastoring the church, but I was still the pastor. I even got up in the pulpit and said, I'm sorry, and uh, still the pastor. I guess if I hang around there any much longer, if they don't run me off, they don't run me off, they might ask me to leave. But uh, too old and fat to run anywhere. Too hard-headed and mean either. And I believe that's the way Carl is, and I thank God for this old man's life, what it's meant to me. There's a lot of young preachers here tonight. I remember... The first time that Brother Estep came here, Brother Estep was a saved man, but he didn't know much about what was going on at camp meeting. He came here. God touched his life. Look back on Brother Joe Cook. Came last year. He's back this year. God touched him. Went home. He wrote me a letter right after he got there, and, and his church had just been, I mean, well, he said just flat dead. That's what he said. He said they had five or six saved just as soon as he got back home. I mean, God just fired him. I mean, God just fired him. There'd been a mini man sitting right here. And there's a boy sitting here on the front row, Mexican boy. A few years back, five, six years ago it was. Brother Carl gave him $1,000. And I was with him the other day in a tent meeting. And they had the tent up. And had a building out behind the tent. And I mean, people just packed out. And been about 200 and something people saved. Uh, this year, they're in that meeting. They've worked in that little old tent up and down that border in Texas, and Brother Carl gave him the first $1,000 to build the building. He's been a blessing to a lot of preachers here. And I know, I know he's blistered some of y'all's hides around here, and, but that's him, amen, that's him. But I want to say something tonight. There's some men here that everybody recognizes as men of God. And I don't believe anybody here would say that Carl Wright was, uh, Carl Lackey was infallible. We know better than that. He's a man like the rest of us. But folks, he's God's man, unusual. I asked Dr. Kanoi one time, he laughed. He said, nobody, nobody, Brother Jack, had ever done the work I've had that Carl Lackey has done with Carl Lackey. That came from an educated mind. And uh, so I thank God for what he's done here. Well, how the Lord's used him these 36 or 7 years he's here. I want you to look in your Bible, and uh, you know you run running out the door. You'll have the misidea of what I'm going to say tonight. And there came two angels of Sodom at evening. Lot sat in the gate of Sodom. And Lot, seeing them, rose up to meet them, and he bowed himself with his face toward the ground. This man was a saved man. This man wasn't in the place where he belonged. He wasn't in the right position with God or nothing else. But this man was a saved man. The Bible said, he said, Behold, now, my Lord, turn in, I pray you. And some of you dispensational nuts, just turn me back on. Don't, don't be turning me off and on. Turn me on. Amen? Thank you. I, I pray you unto your uh, servant's house and tarry all night and wash your feet. And you shall rise up early and go your way. 
And they said, No, but we will abide in the street all night. In other words, they were just going to spend one night in this town. Just one night. And he pressed upon them greatly, and they turned into his, unto him. Now, when the angels came, they didn't want to spend any time at his house. I don't know what was going on in his house. I know what was going on in the city. There's no implication that this man was ever connected with any of this uh, vice and wickedness. But the Bible said that the angels would rather uh, sleep in the street and go down to this man's house. And I wonder tonight if the Lord would come by here. I wonder how he'd like to spend the night down at your house. He pressed them on them, and they turned in unto him, and entered into his house, and he made them a feast. And he did bake unleavened bread. He had become the wife this little wimp had. Like some of y'all. This little wimp here. He was doing the cooking now. He had his little skirt on. He was the cook. The Bible said he baked bread. His wife had a job somewhere working, and uh, he was cooking now. He was babysitting. He was taking care of the family. He, amen, Brother Wood. Thank you. Amen. Amen. Oh, I'll let that soak in a minute. You said, I'm fixing to leave. Help yourself. And everybody know what's wrong. He pressed on them greatly, and they turned into him, and he entered his house, and he, not her, he, I want you to look at him, just a apron on. He made them a feast, and he, and did bake unleavened bread, and they did eat. But they lay down, and the men of the city, even the men of Sodom, compassed the house round about old and young. Now, all the people from every quarter, now, these sodomites were young people and old and all, and they're all wicked, and you don't have to be young to be wicked. You can be old and be wicked. Some folks sitting here tonight, nearly 100 years old, you wicked as a snake. That's right. He said, I don't understand them teenagers. Oh, and God don't understand you, you old sorry devil. That's right. That's right. Amen. You said, I'll tell you one thing, Brother Wood. I. I, I, I wouldn't wear a pair of them pants. I wouldn't either, about as big as you are. <laughs> Amen. They don't use you criticizing these young people. You just wish you was young enough. And they called unto Lot and said unto him, Where are the men which came unto thee this night? Bring them out unto us that we may know them. Lot went out the door and shut the door after him and said, I pray you, brethren. You see, that's what Jim was talking about a while ago. He had... Uh, yeah. He'd got into this unity thing. These are our brethren. We're going to have revival with that bunch of queers. Amen? Lord, have mercy. Brethren, call a bunch of sodomites your brethren. Do not so wickedly. Behold, now I have two daughters which have not known man. Let me pray you, bring them out unto you, and do you to them as good in your eyes. Only these men do nothing. For therefore they came on the shadow of my roof. And they said, Stand back. And they said again, This one fellow came in to sojourn, and he will need be a judge. Now we will deal worse with thee uh, than with them. And they pressed sore upon the man, even Lot, and came near to break the door. But the men put forth their hand and pulled Lot into the house to them and shut to the door. And they smote the men that were at the door of the house with blindness, both small and great, so they wearied themselves to find the door. Yeah. Now, these people were so wicked and so ungodly that when they were totally blind, they were still trying to do what they were doing. Blind as a bat, fell on the judgment of God, and they're still trying to live like the devil. Yeah, right. Amen. Right. That's something, isn't it? But you know the Bible said in verse 12, And the men said unto Lot, Hast thou... Hear any besides son-in-laws and sons and thy daughters? Whatsoever they have in this city, bring them out of this place. For we will destroy this place, because the cry of them is waxed great before the face of the Lord, and the Lord has sent us to destroy it. Lot went out and spake unto his son-in-laws, which married his daughters, and said, Up and get you out of this place, 
for the Lord will destroy this city. But he seemed as one that mocked unto his son-in-law. And when the morning arose, and the angels hastened light, saying, Arise, and take thy wife and thy two daughters, lest thou be consumed in the iniquity of this city. And while he lingered, the men laid hold upon his hand, and upon the hand of his wife, and upon the hand of his two daughters, the Lord being merciful unto him. And they brought him forth, and set him without the city. I got to thinking about this thing tonight, and, and I, I'd like to speak to you. I was a young lady, and I could even call her name tonight. And she lived in our city, and she was raised in a preacher's home, a fine young lady, and, uh, and went off to a, a Christian college and uh, got her degree, and then stayed and got her master's degree uh, in music. And she was a tremendous musician. But uh, driving back and forth through the city of Houston, uh, uh, she'd see all them funny people and gay people and them sodomites and what have you. And, and her daddy had warned her. She was about 25, 26 years old, already had her own apartment, lived out by herself. And, uh, and she said, no, but this night I'm just going to go down and see what they're doing. And that young lady, the first time, the only time in her life she went down to that place in that city, and the next morning they found her in her apartment dead. And the headline said, Woman found and was mutilated like an animal that had a hold of her. And I got to thinking about that thing as I read it. That was her last night in town. Her last night in town. And as I read this story here, this was Lot's last night in town. This was Miss Lot's last night in town. And as I got to reading this thing, this was them two girls last night in town. And for us, all in Sodomites, that was their last night in town. Bless God, it's just the last night in town. Amen. I mean, honey, that's the last night in town. Amen. 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 Two of my friends one night, they said, we're going out and see the town. But they woke up next morning, both of them, in hell. You know what it was? That was their last night in Houston. Now look here, if you will, in your Bible. Brother Wood, what happened here that night? This was a night of an unexpected visitation. I mean, here Lot is, and he's over there living, and he's prospering, and he's got prestige and power and glory and pleasure and everything in the world. Everything's going fine. Who's there? God. And it's the last night in town. Lot said, I didn't expect you to come this early. But God said, I'm here. Amen, Brother Wood. And this was an unexpected visitation. And I'd like to say this. In the hour that you find not the Son of Man coming. And I'd just like to tell you tonight, saved or lost, I'd hate to be living in sin when the Lord come. I'd hate to be into something I had no business in as a child of God. And the Lord knock on my door and say, Jack, it'll be tonight. You and I don't know when we're leaving here. One of my men checked in the hospital the other day. I've known him over 45 years. One of the best friends I ever had. Man's a member of my church, Brother Claude. He checked in that hospital. And I mean, he just, infection got to burning. He'd had a massive heart attack, and they operated on him. He said, oh, you're going home, you're going home, and we give you four or five pints of blood, but you'll be all right. You'll be all right. A few days later, they called me and said, come to the room. I got out in that St. Luke's hospital. I walked up and they said, wash your hands and put a mask on. When it's pumping that blood in him, he's telling his wife, everything's all right. And while it's pumping that blood, they're pumping AIDS into his body. And the night he's laying down there, dying with AIDS. One of my men. If you think I've hated that bunch before, you hang around now. I went in there and he said to me, 
He said, Preacher, I can't even shake your hand. I can't even talk to you. He said, Preacher, can a man even die in this day and time with dignity? It just don't seem like to me this man had any uh, care about the disease and what have you of the wicked. Amen, Brother Wood. Oh, you said, Brother Wood, this is a, a new thing that's come upon us. Man, where have you been? These, these so-called uh, intellectuals, Aristotle. Aristotle was queer as a $3 bill. He said, I don't even like a woman. I love a man. That's supposed to be the father of education. Aristotle, Socrates was queer as a $3 bill. I'm not going to preach on this tonight, but I'm just going to give you this, honey. Amen, amen. <laughs> they called them strumpets back in those days. They didn't use our word, use another word. That's what it means. Amen. Thank you, Brother Wood. You say, I wish I hadn't come. I'm glad you're here. It's a night. It was a night of an unexpected visitation. And God Himself came in person. God didn't send anybody. God Himself showed up. You might not believe this tonight, but each one of us is going to face God personally. Personally tonight, personally you're going to face God. I'm going to you'll face God about this church. You're going to face God about your service. You're going to face God what you've done. You're going to face God with the condition of your heart tonight. You're going to face God regardless whether you're saved or lost tonight. You're going to face God. You'll face Him at the judgment seat or you'll face Him at the great white throne. But everybody in this room tonight going to face God. And there's no doubt about it. Amen. It's an unexpected visitation. Everything going fine. He said, old Abraham didn't know what he's talking about. Now, man, I'm selling these sheep to this bunch of fruitcakes. Man, I'm getting rich. I mean, I'm doing well. I don't have any. I don't. I don't have to take any of that. I just put that off and all that dirt and that filth and that vile. But this Bible said he vexed his soul with a filthy conversation of the wicked. And I'm gonna tell you something tonight. If you're a saved person, you remember the church. You ain't got no business fooling with the wicked. I don't care if he's a wicked lost man or a wicked church member. Only thing you got for a wicked lost man is salvation by grace. Tell him how to be saved. Pray for him. Love him. And I'm going to tell you, when somebody gets wicked in the church, you ain't got no business fooling with it. You said, I'm just listening. And he vexed his soul with the filthy conversation of the wicked. Amen. He came in person. And God don't always just come in person. But that bunch of fruitcakes come out and say, we'll knock down that door. But that was the angel of the Lord was in there and smote him blind. That didn't slow their sinning down a bit. Blindness doesn't change a man's nature. Only Jesus Christ can do that. Amen. Amen? It was a night of unexpected visitation. I mean, a wicked family was there. Wicked friends come to his house. His worldly wife was there. But God showed up. Amen. Amen. It was a night of unparalleled sin. Men came in with nothing on their mind but rape and murder. I'll give you something tonight. be a real blessing to you. Over in the book of Romans, just a minute. And what you think I'm going to say, I ain't going to say. Turn there in the first chapter of Romans. I want to show you something tonight. I pray God show you this, and when you, when you get through, I pray God will show you something that will really help you. The Bible said, being filled with, verse 29, being filled with all unrighteousness and fornication and wickedness and covetousness and maliciousness. Look at that. Being filled with all these things. But when it got down to this next one, it said, full of envy. Brother Jones, could you tell me what envy is? And in your heart, you think you ought to get it, Amen. whatever it is. Whatever. In other words, it, and you get to complaining that you ain't any fire because you don't have it. And so you envy that thing. You want that thing. So you see a preacher preaching, and you begin to envy his ministry. You begin to envy that, and you say, the Lord, you gave that to him, but I'll tell you what, I deserve it more than he does. And I'm going to tell you something. Envy and jealousy 
is put in the same chapter with a bunch of queers. And I'm going to tell you something. When a person comes into church, and I, I've watched, I watched envy, envy. I watched envy get in men. I watched envy. And they said, I should have that say-so. I should have. And, and, and the preacher, you know, somebody takes him downtown, buys him a new suit, and he comes back and they said, I wonder why they bought him that suit. Bless God, I, I, I've been faithful right here. I'm a deacon in this church, and I, I've been, I'm, why didn't he buy me one? Did they buy him a car? Oh, why didn't he buy me one, bless God? I mean, I, I mean, I ought to have one. I mean, as spiritual as I am. You know what's wrong with you? I didn't call you one of those. I just said God listed you with them. And God said he's going to turn you over to a reprobate man. I'm going to tell you something. That sin of envy in the Bible is one of the most terrible sins that there is. This thing reigns and rules in the Baptist church. It tears up churches. It just kills churches. In the end thing, I mean mad at God because God won't give me that power of the pastor. I I've seen a lot of daddy rabbits around the church. Now, I mean, it, they, I mean, what they want is the power of the pastor, but none of the responsibility. Amen, Brother Wood. I mean, hey, Brother Wood, you do the preaching. And Brother Wood, you do the visiting. And we're going to pay you. We're going to take good care of you. Hey, cowboy, I'm not no hire. And you can't pay me. And furthermore, I don't even need you to hit the road. Amen? I had three or four men came over there. We moved to a new church. And boy, they just saw that new church. And a couple of them said, you know, I believe the Lord wants us to move over here. And I said, you know, I prayed about it. He don't. <laughs> well, you said, brother, what I'm trying to get all the members I can. Man, I've been working on mine trying to get rid of three or four of them. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. They're a lot easier to get than they are to get rid of. I mean, some of them just like cancer, honey. They're terminal. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it takes surgery yeah. to get rid of them. Amen. Yeah. I never will forget a man in our church. He's my wife's uncle. I went up to him. I said, uh, Otis, I, I need a faith, big faith. He said, what's that? He said, men wanted to do anything in the world you'd ask us to do. And I said, well, I'm fixing to ask you. We were sitting at a table. I said, I'm fixing to ask you a big faith. He's my song leader. I said, what did he say? Anything you'll ask me, I'll do it. I said, could you and Wanda move y'all's letter somewhere else Sunday? <laughs> you said you didn't do it. God strike me dead if I didn't do it. If I didn't do it, the Lord's my witness. And he said, is that what you want? I said, no. That's not really what I want. But I know in my heart you're not satisfied. And I'm not satisfied. When I get satisfied, I'm ugly. When you get satisfied, dissatisfied, you're ugly. And ain't no use you and I becoming enemies to one another. I love you. You love me. Hit the road. Amen. He left. I saw him in the barber shop the other day. Grabbed me around the neck. Hugged my neck and said, Good to see you, Brother Jack. Amen. was good to see him. He's a good man. He's a good man. But God called me there. He couldn't get along with me. You said you ought to change. I ain't never going to change. How in the world am I going to change? They was in the midst of unparalleled sin. That's where we're living today. These Sodomites were there. Nobody ever saw it like this. Our dear president, I respect him. I thank God for the airplanes he sent up that day. But I heard him make a statement the other day, and I'm not being critical or ugly, but he said, God rest. God rest Rock Hudson's soul. God ain't going to rest his soul. He kicked him off into hell. God ain't going to rest his soul. That man's burning in the flame of the damned. You listen to me tonight. I'm not glad of that. I'm not proud of that. But God said he'll turn the wicked into hell. And that's where he's at tonight. He's messed up little boys and girls and what have you and wasted their lives. And God's going to cast him into hell tonight. That's God looks like the world's going to make a hero out of him. They said, well, he gave $250,000. He 
give that much for a plane ride back from Paris. He rented the plane himself. He went where all queers are going, to hell. Sooner the better. It's a night of unparalleled sin. The Sodomites came, the wrath of God is revealed. Are you looking at your Bible tonight? They came up and God struck them with blindness. You said, Brother Wood, God was supposed to go out and love them. You tell God all that foolishness. Go to Houston and see what we've saw in the last few years. It's a plague upon our land. It's an awful plague. Nothing you and I can do about it but pray. But I guarantee you I'm like David. David said, Lord God, break my enemy's teeth. Hmm? I've said, Lord God, break them's neck. Amen. I pray for him every morning. Fervently, fervently I pray for him. This was a night of unparalleled sin. We, the Bible said we will come perilous times. What is that talking about, preacher? Times that are hard to deal with. And you and I are living in that day and hour when times are hard to deal with. Bless God, it's hard to go to church and have any peace. Amen. Don't sit over there like Pope Pius the 19th and look at me like that. You said, oh, we just having such a lovely time. You bunch of reprobates, you ain't having no good time. You're down there fighting with the wicked. Amen? Bless God, this is a fight. And if you're not armed, you're not going to make it. Amen? Amen. Unparalleled sin. I'm going to hurry tonight. You don't believe it. But uh, I want you to not notice tonight that was a night of unwanted deliverance. God knocked on his door and said, Son, I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to help you. I'm going to get you out of this mess right here tonight. And I, I tell you what I'm going to do, boy. I, I'm going to take you out. I'm going to deliver you from these bunch of fruit cakes. He said, never mind. You come spend the night with me and tomorrow y'all can leave. In other words, I am going to stay. I'd just like to ask you, you said, how far can a saved man go? I don't know. I don't know. But I'll tell you one thing. There's some people sitting right in here enjoys the company of the wicked. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. There's a night of deliverance from sin. You know, I read a book the other day about, some, about the captives of the Indian territories way back on there. And this woman had been captured by the Indians and took there four or five years. And some soldiers come in and got her and took her away. And she said, leave me alone. Leave me alone. Let me go back to my people. And that officer said, you are going to your people. She said, those are my people. Leave me alone. He said, you're a white woman. You've been captured by those heathens. She said, leave me alone. Leave me alone. God sometimes comes and knocks on the door and said, I'm going to deliver you. And you said, just leave me alone. Just leave me alone. Sinner said, leave me alone. But I saw the saints of God say, leave me alone. I'm enjoying this. Furthermore, I don't even want to go to heaven. I got the air condition set on 70 in the house, 70 in my car, 70 at the office, 70 down to church, and I already got me a $100,000 home, and I don't want to go nowhere. Amen, amen, amen. God said, I'll deliver you from this place. He said, uh, y'all can leave in the morning. Amen, Brother Wood. Finally, God began to talk to this man, and this was an unwanted deliverance. God wanted to deliver him for something. He was a child of God. God wanted him out of that wicked place. He didn't want to be delivered for nothing. He wanted to deliver the wicked. God wanted to deliver him to something. God said, look, I got a little place I want to take you. He said, no, take me to that little city of sin right over there. You know, the other day, they brought 16 missionaries out of Mexico, brought them to the border. Amen. The Mexican sitting right there, take them. Brought them to the border. They said, get out of Mexico. The head bishop of Monterey wrote to uh, Mexico City and said, we want every evangelist.
evangelical missionary out of Mexico. Is that, is, that, is that what's going on tonight? That's what's going on. And God shook that city just a little bit. Just, just a little bit. Now, I, I, don't, I don't even hope to understand this. I don't know anything about it. But you know, they tell me, and these boys went down there, Brother Joe and them, boys, they all went down there to see what they could do. And they said there wasn't one church house damaged in that town. God even left the Catholic church standing up. They said there was a building, seven, eight stories, a thousand or so people in it. And said it just said, boom. And said right beside of it, ten foot over, was a Catholic church and wouldn't even have a crack. You say, where'd that earthquake hit? It's a little town right outside of Mexico City called Little Hell. You make fun of God. You make fun of that place called Hell. You call your little city hell, and one night God will show up. God will show up. Amen? Amen. And just as sure as you're sitting in this seat tonight, the people in America are sympathizing with a wicked society. And God said, I'll, I'll show you how to turn them around. And God sent a plague on this country. And now America said, we, 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 just, can't, we just can't put up with this. I, I mean, we just, I mean they, we're going to have to get rid of these people. We've got to put them on a boat. We've got to do something. Hey, there's movements tonight to get rid of that bunch of fruitcakes. God will stir your nest yeah. when judgment comes. And judgments came. It's here, buddy. It's here. It's the night of unwanted deliverance. Well, I want you to notice something as well. It's the night of unreal heartache. I mean, here's a man. He's living peaceful at his house. Them fruitcakes ain't never bothered him or nothing. He ain't never bothered them. But God shows up. And I'm going to tell you something down at your house or anybody else's house. When God shows up, the devil will show up. You said, I ain't having any trouble at all. You're backslid. You said, I ain't having any trouble at all. You're probably not even saved. But if you're saved tonight and you live for God, I'll guarantee you one thing. The devil will show up. Amen? And so that was a night of unreal heartache. He lost his function. He lost his family. He lost his friends. He lost his home. He lost everything he had. One night, the last night in town, all the heartache in the world. God said, that's all. I've had enough of it. Ooh, hallelujah. You people got a lot of responsibility. People away playing back to church hurt a whole lot. And you ain't only hurt a whole lot, you saw a whole lot. You have stood right here and witnessed a whole lot that other half of the world ain't never seen. I mean, boy, you've just seen God answer prayer. You've seen God call out men out of this church. You've seen God save the worst and the vilest and the wickedest. I mean, you've just seen God build this thing debt-free. You've just seen God do it all. You saw God do it. And everything that you saw God do one day will rise up as a witness again. And God said you didn't only hear it. Bless God, you saw it. You saw them running around this building with their hands over their head of shouting glory. You've seen the, the, the harlots and the drunkards and the bootleggers and the gamblers and the thieves get saved. You saw God do a great work here. But I'm telling you tonight, there's coming a time when it's going to be unreal hardy when them sons and daughters said, ha, 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 ha. Leave here. Ha, You listen to me tonight? You said, I believe I will made up my mind now, preacher. I've waited 10 or 15 years, but I believe I'll just go with God now. Come on, wife. He said, I ain't a-going. I ain't a-going. What happened to that man? He didn't only lose his children. That woman said, Lot, I don't want to go. I mean, I've been down there while you was cooking them meals and, and you had that little apron on, you little wimp. I don't follow you no further. You got a noodle for a backbone. You ain't nobody. I don't believe nothing you say. You've always talked about a little bit of God and a little bit of this, but, I mean, you know, you ain't got no testimony. Lot. Hey, Lot, I ain't going with you. 
You better listen to me, young man. You better stand for God now. It'll come a time when that woman ain't got a lick of respect for you. Amen, preacher. All your wealth, he had to leave it. He said, I'll tell you one thing, Brother Wood, I'm going to take all my money with me. Where you're going, it'll all burn up anyway. It won't make any difference. Take it on with you. Amen? Amen. I don't like you. His friends were lost forever. Here's a man who knew Abraham. Here's a man who knew what it meant to walk with God. Here's a man who saw Abraham hear from God. Here's a man who saw God answer prayer. Here's a man that heard God's voice. And yet this man, all of his friends, died and go to hell. And he has no testimony whatsoever. He's talking about heartache. Then he stood outside that city with Alan Jones and watched her go up in smoke. Everything that he'd ever did in his whole life, going up in smoke. A man called me to his bedside the other day, and he said, You know, preacher, I've told you a hundred times that I'm going to live for God. He said, Preacher, 28 years ago you led me to Christ, and I know I got saved 28 years ago. But he said, I'll tell you one thing. When I get out of this hospital, I'm going to live for God. He got out. He come home. And about four Sundays later, I missed him. And the next Sunday, I missed him. And I said, he came to church the third Sunday, been out three Sundays. I said, where you been, boy? He said, well, I, I tell you, something, I ain't been feeling good. I said, now tell me how to rest up. He said, well, I'll just be honest. We said, I bought me six cows and a bull, and I took them up out of my plate. But tonight, I'm waiting for the call to go bear. They sent him home the other day and said, that's all. Go home and die. Do as you please. I don't want to die that way. I don't want to die that way. In that bed in that emergency room where they put him in that hospital, he looked at his boy down the end of the bed. He said, Son, are you going to take me to church when I get out? And I looked at that 34-year-old boy, his face swelled up that big from cirrhosis of the liver, and he said, Yeah, Dad, when you get out, I'll take you. But I remember Jerry Monday 28 years ago that boy came down the aisle, and he said, I, I want to be saved. A few years later, that boy said, I want to surrender and preach, and I want to give my life to the Lord. And I watched that daddy get away from God, and I watched that boy get away from God, and I watched that boy marry a Catholic woman. And you know what that granddaddy said to me the other day? He said, you know it's not so bad, die. He said, all four of my grandchildren are Roman Catholic, and I'll never see them again. I ain't never going to see him again. Them my grandbabies. He said, Jack, I've held them on my knees and played with them. And they're 10 or 12 years old. But their mama has raised them in that church. And Jack, I'm no better. I said, son, it's too late now to get concerned. You're going home to die. It's too late. You better pray for me. That boy, he's praying for us. He no use praying. He's dying. Dr. Thorne says, you ain't got three months more to live. you got cirrhosis of the liver. His face is swelled. It's flushed. He's dying. He's dying. Tom's dying. And his children are going to die and go to hell. Daddy said, I'll tell you one thing. I said, I just want to ask you one question. Would you just be honest with me and tell me why you got out of church? He said, money. I scratched my head. I said, run that by me one more time. He said, money. I said, you ain't never had a dime in your life. He said, yeah, but I always want it. And always trying to get it. And he's dying tonight. He couldn't pay the doctor bill. He couldn't get a shoe shine on the corner. He's dying. And he died for a, an imagination of the mind that someday he's going to get a hold of something. And all he ever got a hold of was death. This life is filled with some heartaches. Lot got his part. And then this was a night of unlimited judgment. God sent blindness. God sent a burning fire. God sent a block of salt. And 
God sent the brimstone. I'm going to tell you, it was a dark night. It was a dark night. And I'll just be honest with you, I just don't want to be around when the plague starts. I, I just don't want to be around. I, I'm glad now that I'm going out at the rapture. And I, I, but I, I'm just being honest with you. I, I hope it's next week. And, and tonight would be a lot better. I, I'm telling you, we're looking at some things that nobody can... I'm telling you, lost people tonight are concerned about what's going on in this nation. And sir, all right. It was a night of unlimited judgment. He lost his home. He lost his city. He lost his family. He lost everything. Now that's unlimited judgment. Then I want to show you something here, if you will. And I want to close. You didn't think I was going to close that fast, but I ain't. The Bible said, And while he lingered, the men laid hands upon his hand. They got him by the hand, Brother Sonny. And they said, Now come here. Come, come on. See here, Sonny? See what I said right there? They said, And he said, Escape for the life. There was an unconditional love here that night. I mean, I, I don't understand this thing, but this was a night of unconditional love. It just looks like to me that God would have backed up and said, just rain down fire on all of them. They all deserve it. That's not what God said. That's not what God said. But God commended His love toward us while we were yet sinners. Christ died for us. Glory be to God tonight. I never got what I deserved. I never got what I thought I was going to get. I never got what man thought I ought to get. I never even got what my wife thought I ought to get. I got grace. Amazing, marvelous grace of God. This was a night, a night of unconditional love. Hey, God, you ought to help me. No. Lord, he said nothing. He wasn't looking for mercy, and he wasn't looking for grace. But mercy and grace both showed up. That's the way an old sorry Christian is. That's the way an old backslider is. He's looking for another dollar. <laughs> and God's looking for him. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. This Bible said, Hereby perceive we the love of God because he laid down his life for us. I carry in my pocket from an old Detroit outlaw pocket knife, the little case, surgical knife. And the man that carried that knife for a great number of years was a friend of mine. He's dead now. He died of sickness. He had lead eaters. Somebody shot him right behind the ear. His sister told me, said he died of a natural cause. I said, just now, I looked behind his ear, and I said, it was natural for him to do that. And sure was. I never said a word. I never, I never argued with her and everything. I already knew the story and everything. But this old boy was a friend of mine before I was ever saved. And I just want to tell you this tonight. I never did have to look around to find out where he was at or where he stood or what he's going to do. I never had to figure out nothing about Jerry Rigsby. standing right there. Right there. And I, one time he called me. I was in the Florida. Some, some of you preachers was there. But, but Jeremy, I believe you was there at that time. And he came to Leroy Dowd, which was an old outlaw. And he come down and he said, he called my wife and he said, uh, where's Jack? And he said, down in Florida, preaching a camp meeting. He said, what in the world is that? Living in Detroit. Now, you boys from Detroit, I'll tell you where he lived. He lived on Wabash Avenue. Now, when you live on Wabash Avenue, you either a different color than I am, or you an outlaw. One of the other. One of the other. He was the other. He's white as I am, but he was dangerous. Amen? Don't go to camp meeting. He come to that camp meeting. Oh, brother, what's that old, that old, uh, that old preacher's name that uh, Joe Parson went into God years ago? And old you sire. And old you sire got after him. You sire got after him. And boy, and I mean, right during that service, he was there three days. He said, man, I'm getting out of here, Jack. He said, this, he keeps getting on my nerves, man. He said, I, I ain't never been to church in my life. 
And he said, my God, he said, they're screaming and shouting. He said, they're about to drive me crazy. I wasn't wrong about Hey, God, God was working on old Jerry's heart. Boy, the third day I seen old you tires. You know, you never could talk. When you talk, you tell what you're doing, boy. Huh? What you doing, boy? You, boy, you're going to get tased. You're going to get tased. You're going to get tased. And boy, I seen him and Jerry coming to the office. Him and Jerry knelt right there. Right there. Man, 50 years old. Gangster, outlaw, criminal. God. Unconditionally. Say. An old pimp. An old thief. An old outlaw. I asked him, I said, when there's burning deep part, what was you doing? He said, stealing everything I could find. He said, boy, Jack, when they built that fire, he said, everybody went to the fire. And he said, some of them other people went down there where them a uh, cheap place was. He said, I went out in rich town. He said, all them rich people watching the TV. He said, I, he said, man, we had a heyday. I got to tell you this. I got to tell you this. He had a friend there. a colored friend of his. They're thieves together. And he came over and he said, uh, uh, Jerry, he said, I want you to come and uh, go over here with me. He said, Duh. I've cased this house out. And boy, he said, uh, them Yankees are gone down to Florida. And he said, this house got silverware, coin collection. Jerry said, yeah, but it's got a big government piece in the front yard. <laughs> this colored man said, but, but sir, he said, I've been feeding him below. Me. And he said, me and that dog, we done become friends. Mm -hmm. He said, I've been feeding that Yankee dog baloney. And he said, boy, I just feeding him and feeding him, and we friends. He said, I don't believe I want to go with you. I'm scared of them dogs. Three days later, the doctor called him, the hospital called him, and said, do you have a friend by the name of so-and-so? He said, I sure do. And they said, would you come over here? A dog could nearly eat him up. <laughs> he went in that hospital room. He tiptoed in there, and there was a man laying there. Dog get bit him all over his face, all over his arms, all over his legs. And he said, I thought you and that government people were friends. He said, we were. He said, we didn't have any problem at all. But he said, when I opened that door, there was a bull tear in there that I never had met before. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you listen to me tonight. I ain't never met that little tail before. <laughs> Amen. Yeah. And the fact, just fine tonight, that God was so loving old thief and an outlaw and a gangster. I saw him stuff his wife in the back of a car. After she took an overshot of dope. She did it there. Stuffed her in the car and left the car. Six days later, they put a gas mask on and took her out. But God, but God commended his love to her. And some of you renegades sitting right here, you ain't a bit better. Oh, you said, I never done that. Uh, you don't want nobody to tell what you've done either. I tell you what you better do. You better hurriedly run to the blood of Jesus. Amen. And find that cleanse and flow. Amen. This is exactly what happened here. This Bible said in 1 John 4, And we have known and believed that the love of God has to us. My soul tonight. What? Give a testimony. I ran and I ran and I ran and an unconditional love overtook me down in the Sodomite and saved me and delivered me and took me out of that city before God rained down fire and judgment. Tonight I pray you're here unsaved without God. You run hurriedly to the love of God. But God, mm, but God mm, commended His love for us while we were yet sinners. Isn't that wonderful? My Savior loves sinners. They love sinners. When the messenger comes, he come to seek and to save. That which was lost, and God wants to save you tonight. God wants to save you, boy or girl. God wants to save you, mom and daddy. God wants to save you tonight. An old backslider, old lot, God wants you to come weeping your way back home. Tonight. And say, Lord, I'm sorry. Every head bowed, let us pray.
Every head bowed, let us pray. Amen. I wonder tonight with every head bowed, everyone praying, you say, Brother Wood, I don't want you to raise your hand. You say, I know I'm lost tonight. I know I'm not saved. This could be your last night in town. All I know is the Bible said it's appointed on the man wants to die. But after this, the judgment. I mean, God has appointed a day in which he will judge the world by that man, Christ Jesus. That's all I know. That's all I know tonight. This could be our last night in town. They could wake up in the morning and wonder where White Plains is at. We could be on the other side. Oh, listen tonight. Everybody here that's been studying the Bible long knows the curtain. The drama is about over. The curtain is about drawn. We can hear the trampling of the horses tonight. The Son of God is coming. He's coming for His children. And I warn you tonight, child of God, don't go home with dirty hands. Don't go home with a dirty mouth and a dirty heart. Go home clean tonight. Rush to the altar. Right now, before we ever sing the invitation, rush to the altar. You come now. You come right now. This might be our last night in town. Last night in town. Christian, why don't you come to the altar and say, Lord, I'm all mixed up. But I'm sorry the way I've acted. I'm sorry the way I've conducted my Christian life. And Lord, I really don't want to wind up like Lot. But Lord, you was merciful to him. Would you be merciful to me tonight? And he will. I'll guarantee you tonight he will. Would you come? Men are already coming. That's right. Just come right on. Just come right on tonight. Just come right on. Senator Fred. This could be your last night in town. This could be your last night in town. No one ever expects to go, but everybody here knows one day we're going. Some people never make preparation to go, and yet you're going to leave. This could be your last night in town. You might be a young preacher. You might even be a pastor of a church. And this might be your last night. Brother Carl never knew he was going to be laying up in that bed tonight. As I talked to him this evening, his conversation is kind of garbled up. His arm is... He never expected that. But there's not a person who don't know. But he said to me a while ago, he said, well, I preached all week last week. Done what I could. He said, I wanted to help my friend, the past, whoever it was at that church. He said, I wanted to help him. I told him I would, and I just wanted to help him. Well, that'd be a good way to go home. I mean, just help the friend, preach the Word of God, try to challenge somebody to live for God, and Wake up in the next morning in another world. Say, what a beautiful place. Well, hello there, Brother Steve. How are you, Brother Olaf? Brother Abraham, how are you getting along, huh? Yeah, well, hello there, Paul. I've always wanted to meet you. Wouldn't that be a wonderful, wonderful way to go? But could I say to you tonight, my wife called me in the middle of the night, and I had a friend who stepped out of her car down in Texas yesterday. And just as she stepped out, never been sick before, she went to meet God. She was a saved woman. Had been saved many years ago. Had a husband who had a real testimony for God and he'd done gone on. But this woman wasn't ready to go. She just wasn't really prepared to meet God at this very hour. But that's sometimes the way he called when we're not ready. Do you remember as kids we played hide and go see? We counted to a hundred and said, here I come, ready or not. And that's what he's going to do 
ready or not, he's coming. Why don't you just come on right now? You're unsaved, go on to hell. You say, preacher, I need to be saved. Oh, it's so simple to be saved. Somebody's waiting right now with a Bible, a man or a woman, a young person waiting here at the front. Come and be saved tonight. Father, we commit the Word of God unto Thee. You said it was the power of God unto salvation. Save that soul tonight. And reclaim that life, that one that's drifted far away from God. Lord, speak to them tonight before this meeting's over. And give them a freshness, the freshness of that other world upon their lives. We'll praise you for it, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's all stand. Everyone's standing. Let's stand. There Let's stand. is.